Hi, this is Jason Walker, Assistant Professor of Biology at Florida State College of Jacksonville, Kent Campus. And this is the very first lecture for BSC 2010C, Introduction to Biology 1 for Majors. And it is titled Biology in the Tree of Life. Throughout the next two courses, Biology 1 and Biology 2, we're going to be looking at how life is organized. We're going to start at the molecular level, talking about atoms and what those are. And then we're going to be working our way up through cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, organisms, and eventually the higher levels, such as ecology, uh, biomes, and even the, full, the entire biosphere. So what does it mean to be alive? We're going to talk about six characteristics of life that all have to be present in order for something to be considered alive. First, life must have order. All of life emerge from complex organization of interacting molecules. So everything that exists in life is actually very, very ordered, yet very, very complex. And we'll go about over what that means here in the next few slides. One of the main properties of life is that it reproduces itself. And this is known as biogenesis, bio meaning life, genesis meaning the creation of, and it literally translates to life comes from life. And we know a few molecules that are able to, to reproduce themselves, and the two that really come to mind are DNA and RNA. And these molecules by themselves have the ability to reproduce themselves, However, DNA and RNA by themselves are not considered alive. It requires something more. However, this is a very, very important aspect of something that's alive, the ability to reproduce itself. Another property of life is that it grows and develops. Um, and by growth, I mean simply gaining mass. Now, we know things that are not necessarily alive, have the ability to grow. Take the example of uh, stalactites and stalagmites within a cave. Water drips down through the limestone, and over time, um, they can gain mass. Uh, but for the most part, they don't really develop. They don't change form. And really, development is a very key property of life. And by changing form, we mean that something changes from one thing to another thing. So we have two different examples here. Here you can see frogs in, an, in eggs, and you can see uh, a seedling. That seedling changes its form, that is a radish seedling, and it's going to change from something that looks like that into an actual radish, which we know and, and love to eat in our salads. Another important property of life is that all organisms use energy in order to go through their life processes of growth, development, and reproduction. It was thought for a long time that all life on Earth depended upon the sun, and the energy was utilized through a process called photosynthesis to create plants and blue-green algae, and they were considered the basis of all life on Earth. Everything that ate plants and the things that ate those things were considered dependent upon the sun as the, the, the sole source of energy on Earth. Well, as we started to look at the oceans and look deep in the oceans, we began to notice that there, there were these vents where there was plethora of organisms that were present in the complete absence of the sun. And they weren't being fed by organisms from the top. They were actually being fed by hydrogen sulfide gas um, that was coming up from these vents. And so we now know that there's two different mechanisms for energy um, that, that organisms use in order to grow and reproduce, either chemosynthesis or from the sun. Another property of life is that life responds to the environment in a process known as stimulus response. And here we have two examples of stimulus response that happens in different organisms. Um, stimulus in the Venus flytrap is caused by these trigger hairs, and it's kind of an interesting story. You can't just flick one trigger hair and cause a Venus flytrap to close. It requires a tr either one trigger hair to be hit twice or two different trigger hairs to be hit um, simultaneously in order for the Venus flytrap to close. However, it's not just 
um, stimulus response in plants, there's also stimulus response in animals as well. And here we have an Arctic fox, and it is either um, brown in the summer or white in the winter. And the reason is for camouflage. And so this Arctic fox is responding to its stimulus, it's responding to its environment, and it produces different colored fur based on the type of season. So we know that life has a response to its environment. Another property of life is homeostasis. Homeo means same, and stasis means equilibrium. So homeostasis is defined as the regulatory mechanisms that maintain an organism's internal environment even though its external environment may fluctuate. What this means is, is that no matter what the external environment does, the internal environment of, of the organism has the ability to maintain a, a stable internal structure. Warm-blooded animals are a great example of homeostasis. Warm-blooded animals have the ability to maintain their temperature no matter what the temperature is outside. In a dog, if it's hot outside, they can't sweat, but they can pant. And so they bring in cool air through their lungs, and it's transferred to their body. And the faster that they breathe, the more cool air comes in and cools their body. In a jackrabbit, they have large ears, not so that they can hear, but so that they can actually cool themselves. By having the large surface area, uh, they are able to transfer heat out, out of their ears, and it cools off their body much faster. They have the ability, basically, to get rid of heat from their bodies through these large ears. And perhaps the final property of life is that it is evolutionarily adapted to its environment. What this means is, Life evolves as a result from interactions between organisms and their environment. In this picture right here, what do you see? You see a tree, a stick. There's actually a, a walking stick on there, which is an insect. And the walking stick has evolved to mimic what a tree looks like in order to be protected from predators. So this is an example of an organism being adapted to its environment. Okay, so now we're going to go over some of the basics of science in general. So, what is a theory? And what is a hypothesis? A theory is an explanation for a general phenomenon. Whereas a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a very specific phenomenon. Components of both of these are pattern and process. Pattern is something that occurs, and a process is something that's responsible for creating that pattern. There are two main theories in biology, the cell theory and the theory of evolution by natural selection, which we'll discuss here in the next few slides. So the cell theory of life has three main components. First, all life is made of cells. In order for something to be alive, the theory is that it has to be incorporated within cells. By this notion, things like viruses, such as HIV, and herpes are not considered to be alive, even though they have many of the characteristics of life, including reproduction, adaptation to their environment, and stimulus response. Cells are the basic unit of life. They're capable of performing all the activities of life, all the properties of life that we just discussed. And the third component of the cell theory is that all cells have come from other cells. The second theory in biology is the theory of evolution. And this is the idea that all species share common ancestry. And the process by which we have come to speciate in order to get new species is descent with modification. We have descended from ancestral species in which the characteristics of those species have changed through time. Now, this came to be known as evolution. And evolution as a pattern is nothing more than the change in characteristics of population through time. And the process with which we, we think most evolution occurs is via natural selection. Charles Darwin coined this term, um, and he coined it from working with uh, uh, pigeons and horses, which he was actually artificially selecting, and people had been artificially selecting for a long time. But he came to notice within population, individual characteristics vary. And he came to believe 
that some of those variable, variable characteristics enhances the potential for reproducing of certain individuals within a population more so than other, and that those individuals within a population that are more able to reproduce are going to have more offspring in the future and therefore lead the way of evolution. Science is a hypothetical deductive process. What this means is that science stems from hypotheses. And this is where a scientist will have a specific question and he'll propose a possible answer. Steps to producing a good hypothesis is that it must be stated precisely. It cannot be vague and it has to be testable. And in science, we design experiments that are specifically able to test the predictions of a hypothesis. And it's deductive. And what that means is, from general ideas, we're able to make very specific predictions. And those typically take, take the case as if-then statements. So if you wanted to take the idea of coffee, if I drink a lot of coffee in the morning, then I'll be really, really, really excited. So that's a good example of a, a deductive idea. And from that, we can actually test it. In other words, it's not inductive. We can't make specific circumstances into general predictions. We take general predictions and then predict specific circumstances. Now there's a few more steps to this process, so we're going to take this uh, all the way through. So a question might be, gosh, why am I always so bloody tired in the morning? Well, you can create a if-then statement as, I, as your hypothesis. Well. Perhaps if I quit coffee, then I'll be more alert. Now, is that a specific testable hypothesis? Hmm, let's see. Well, I'm going to create an experimental design. All right, I'm going to quit coffee. You're going to do the experiment. You quit coffee. And then you have to do data analysis. Somehow you have to measure alertness before and after. And preferably, it would be best to measure it with numbers because with numbers, we can do statistics. And with statistics, we can actually test whether something is truly different from something else. And then we're going to re we're going to graph the results. So you're going to graph alertness, and then you're going to have a conclusion. You're either going to reject or you're going to fail to reject your hypothesis. And here's a really important thing about science: it has to be repeatable. A lot of things can happen just once, and um, it's not exactly true. It can just happen by circumstance or coincidence. And for science to really be accepted by the scientific community, it has to be repeated and repeatable. The other really important thing about science is that we have control and experimental groups. Now, whenever we create an experiment, we want to change one thing at a time. And the thing that we're changing are grouped into experimental groups. The thing that where nothing changes is known as the control group. So what would be the experimental and control variables in this example? In this experiment, we compare the effects of varying sugar concentrations in the rates of diabetes in mice. Now, we can go back to the dependent and independent variable and say, what depends on what? Blank depends on blank. What do you think? Well, if you thought that diabetes in mice depends on sugar concentration, you are right. So therefore, the diabetes in mice is the dependent variable, and the independent variable is the sugar concentrations. So if we had our x and y graph, the x-axis would be sugar concentrations, and the y-axis would be diabetes in mice. So the thing that we change in the different groups is always the independent variable. So in this case, what changes? Is it Do we change the diabetes in mice or do we change the sugar concentrations? So if you said sugar concentrations, you were right. So in this particular experiment, what you would expect is that there will be a control group with no sugar at all added within, the, um, within that group. And then you might have several different groups with varying amounts of sugar concentrations. And then from there, we would measure the rate of diabetes within those mice. 
All right, there are a lot of really bad experiments out there, but a well-designed experiment really isn't very difficult to create. It always, always, always must have a control group for comparisons, because if you don't have a control group, you don't really know, you can't really compare what the effect was with, with what the effect wasn't. And so you have to have a control group in order to compare different, different um, experiments. All right. The experimental conditions must be controlled to eliminate other variables. So I can't change the rate of sugar concentration and the type of food and the amount of exercise and all that stuff at the same, in the same experiment to see the effects of rates on diabetes. You have to control just one. And I said this before and I'll say it again. The test has to be repeated to reduce the effects of a small sample size. Small sample size can have really tremendous effects on the, the results that you get. And so really anything can happen and anything is expected to be happening with small sample size. So you have to be able to repeat it and you have to be able to design a test that is repeatable um, by other scientists in the field in order to be considered a well-designed experiment. Okay, so we're going to show you a great example of a really well-designed experiment done by this guy named Louis Pasteur. Ring a bell? Well, think of something that has been pasteurized, like milk or apple juice or anything else really that you buy that is liquid. Louis Pasteur is the guy that really invented the process of, you guessed it, pasteurization. This is an example of an experiment that he created that uses a lot of the steps of a great experimental design. Now, what was his question? His question was, well, do cells arise spontaneously or do they arise from other cells? Now, the first was, we used to think that um, specific organisms spontaneously generated. In other words, cells arise spontaneously from non-living materials. And so, you know, they saw that they, if they put this broth in an open flask um, and they sterilize it, then cells would just start to grow in it. They used to think maggots, which turn into flies, just spontaneously started growing within meat. And he wasn't so sure about this. He came up with this idea that all cells come from cells hypothesis, in which he thought that cells were only produced from other pre-existing cells. So he has two different groups here. He has a control, the normal group, and then the experimental group. In the control group, it's as it was. The thing was done as it was. So he had some cells which started um, started in a broth, in a flask, he sterilized it, and then lo and behold, cells started to grow in that tank. So the a hypothesis or the, the prediction or the um, explanation for that was, well, I think cells might actually be coming in through the hole. So he devised, he designed this uh, this swan necked flask, he sterilized it and he put uh, a block between um, between the out, outer end and the inner and cells developed within the, the neck of the swan flask but nothing ever came to the inside. So from this his experimental group was the the flask and so with this his, this experiment actually supported the idea that all cells come from cells. So again, this is a great example of a really, really well done experiment, which is repeatable and it has a control group and is very, very well done.